Thank you for watching this video. My name is Alan Chim and I am an emergency physician and ultrasound enthusiast based at all of you UCLA. In the next 15 minutes, I will give you a whirlwind tour of emergency and clinical ultrasound as a field and how it is practiced at our institution. I will also answer some common questions that you may have. First, if you feel that you are familiar with the philosophy of point of care ultrasound, you can skip to the latter section on logistics by clicking here or go to about the 9 minute 45 second mark. First, what is emergency ultrasound or clinical ultrasound or point of care ultrasound or POCUS or bedside ultrasound? I'll tell you at first what US or POCUS is not about. So say you have a patient with abdominal pain. You perform your history and physical and as you come out of the room you are somewhat sure of what the patient may have. You then decide to order an ultrasound study, which is performed by a technician trained to perform ultrasounds. But the technician doesn't have any real medical training, such as in pathophysiology of disease, physical examination, or patient management. But they are very, very good at acquiring ultrasound images, which are then transmitted to the radiologist who has substantial medical training and has a deep understanding of anatomy, physiology, and disease. This radiologist interprets the study and communicates the findings to the clinician. This process works. However, it does take time, an average of at least one to two hours from the time the clinician places the order to when the interpretation comes back. In a busy practice environment like the emergency department, that extra time means other patients will have to wait longer, either to be roomed or for their formal ultrasound study. This process is fragmented as well, since the clinician has the clinical context but not the ability to acquire or interpret the images, and the radiologist has the ability to interpret the study absent the clinical context. Most of the time, the interpretation correlates with the patient's presentation, but not infrequently, it does not correlate. And worse, there may be incidental findings or incidental lomas that trigger additional testing not relevant to the patient's acute presentation. This is not what clinical ultrasound is about. Instead, it is about having the same patient presentation, performing the same evaluation, and instead of ordering the ultrasound study, the clinician is trained to evaluate common pathologies using ultrasound at the bedside. So for instance, if the patient has right upper quadrant pain, suspicious for either cholecystitis, renal colic, or even appendicitis, the clinician can perform the ultrasound with those questions in mind. True. The patient may have something like mesenteric adenitis or fibromatosis that is not assessed with focused bedside ultrasound, but the clinician can use ultrasound to route the more common diagnoses, leaving the more uncommon diagnoses on the table and room for subsequent workup. Now, if the patient has a common diagnosis that is picked up on the clinician's ultrasound, then the process of ordering an imaging study and waiting for the interpretation is reduced or eliminated. Medication such as antibiotics, can be started earlier, consultants can be notified more expediently, and critical bedside interventions, if needed, can be initiated. In other words, clinical ultrasound can reduce the time to diagnosis, giving more time for the patient to be treated and to heal. Now clinicians, and specifically emergency physicians, have over the past quarter century developed the skill, the training, and evidence base to perform many focused ultrasounds. From head to toe, we look for increased cranial pressure or posterior chamber pathologies with ocular ultrasound. We look for presence of pulmonary edema, pneumothorax, and pleural effusions with thoracic ultrasound, as well as echo, um, looking for systolic function, RV strain, and pericardial effusions. We look for biliary pathology with our ultrasound, hydronephrosis, ectopic pregnancy um, as well, and also deep venous thrombosis and soft tissue pathologies. There has been increasing support for point-of-care ultrasound or POCUS by other specialties such as internal medicine, surgery, and pediatrics. The president of the American Society of Echocardiography in 2016 had this to say about POCUS. Dr. Rieger says, there is no denying that if I were to suffer a sudden hemodynamic collapse that I would want to wind up in an emergency department in which the emergency physicians were fully trained in POCUS. In addition, many specialties are beginning to incorporate POCUS in residency training, much as emergency medicine began to do in the late 1990s. 
So not only has POCUS expanded from emergency medicine to other specialties, but it's also gained further recognition from traditional imaging specialties like radiology and cardiology. The UCLA All of You Emergency Ultrasound faculty are primarily responsible for ultrasound training for the emergency medicine residents, fellows, and faculty. In addition, we train medical students in several first and second year labs and in a selective as well as offering a fourth year two week elective. We also take several off service resident rotators on our two week elective every year. Last year, we also began to train the UCLA surgery residency on the extended FAST exam as well as the critical care division on several ultrasound applications. As of 2016, this is our group of fellowship trained ultrasound faculty and fellow who will be responsible for your ultrasound training. In addition, we have Dr. Salabian, our MSK radiologist, who leads several of our scan shifts, as well as several cardiologists and critical care faculty that you may interact with. So for the EM residents, you've already received some ultrasound training during boot camp. Most of your formal training will be during your two-week rotation, which allows you to scan every day with ultrasound faculty. In addition, there are several conference lectures and workshops that we will give over the year. However, the bulk of your development, as in any skill you develop during residency, will be from caring for your patients. This includes performing your ultrasound and applying your findings to your management. Only in this way will you develop the skills and confidence to use ultrasound in patient care. Now we have a feedback mechanism in place in which we review your images on usually a weekly basis. We will look at your interpretation in EPIC or ORCID, and if there is a disagreement or we feel that you can improve your technique, we will let you know. Learning how to teach a subject is also a good way to develop mastery. Multiple opportunities will exist over the year to serve as ultrasound instructors for our medical students. Finally, we offer special electives for senior residents who are interested in more advanced ultrasound applications. It is crucial that you practice ultrasonography during your training because we know that competency develops not only with formal training, but consistent practice and feedback. This study looked at accuracy as a function of number of studies performed by almost 200 emergency physicians during training. As you can see, competency is defined by 90% or better accuracy compared to ultrasound faculty depends on the application, but usually requires at least 25 to 50 studies. However, note the widening confidence intervals and the slight dipping in the curves. This could be due to the smaller amount of individuals with a larger number of studies, but it also suggests that without recurrent feedback and study, your skills will plateau and may actually decline. This is a good question. When should I order the formal study? This depends. If you're doing this because you like your patients and want to keep them in the ED longer, that is not a good reason. Nor is it a good reason to expose patients to unnecessary radiation. Now, if you're not confident with your skills and you and your attending want a confirmatory study, by all means, order it. We just hope that over time and with practice that you begin to trust your skills so that you feel less inclined to order a confirmatory study. We also understand that many of our consultants want a formal study for documentation. They may not be able to interpret the study and having a radiologist's interpretation reduces any liability for misfindings. This is why we focus so much on medical student and specialty training, because we want to build that capacity so that in the future, when you are able to upload your acute cholecystitis study into the PACS, the surgeon will be able to look at your images and act upon them. Or having the hospitals look at your normal focus echo on an admitted chest pain patient, and then deciding not to order a formal echo. In this era of the Affordable Care Act and increasing coordination of care, POCUS is one answer to better, more cost-efficient patient care. Now, say you see something unexpected, for example, you're looking for hydronephrosis and see a complicated renal cyst. These patients will need a formal ultrasound to better characterize the malignancy potential of the cyst. However, these can be done as outpatients and not in the emergent setting. Before we turn to the All of You UCLA workflow, if you're interested in hearing more about POCUS, here are two TED Talks given by Dr. Risa Lewis and Chris Fox. Just click onto the links. Okay, how does this all happen? At all of you, you'll wheel the ultrasound machine into the patient's room, turn it on, and register the patient. In the near future, this registration step may be easier, 
once the process of setting up ORCID to communicate directly with ultrasound machines is completed. Then it will be a matter of placing an order in ORCID for an ED ultrasound and then selecting the patient order on the machine. Again, this is planned but not completed. So currently you'll have to manually register the patient on the machine. So then you perform the ultrasound study or studies that are necessary. You'll then end the patient encounter on the machine and disinfect the probe. When you get back to the physician charting room, you will communicate the findings to the providers if you're not taking care of the patient, then place an interpretation in the ultrasound note template in ORCID or EPIC. Now the ultrasound notes will make it easier for us to find and keep track of your interpretations. However, feel free to also document in your provider note. This note by one of our residents should be framed as it highlights the potential of clinical ultrasound to significantly improve patient care by reducing time to diagnosis as well as radiation and other invasive procedures. Okay, now let's focus on the ultrasound machines. We currently have two M-Turbos which are discussed in the prior nomology video, so I'm only going to cover the export which is available at both the Reagan and all of you EDs. The first thing is about simple ergonomics. Here's how to lock the machine in place, like this, and how to adjust the height if needed. Next, turn on the machine by pressing this button, and then you can adjust the touch screen and monitor if you like. The monitor can also be collapsed forward 90 degrees for transfer or storage. Once the machine finishes booting up, you will have a menu with four options, which we'll cover later. To register your patient, press the blue Enter button. Then the patient's last name, MRN, indication, and your user initials or name. List EDU for education if you're just scanning for practice. Press Done, and then you'll select the transducer and preset here. As with the M-Turbo, you have specific preset exams for each transducer. After your selection, press the green Scan button on the bottom left to start. Next is Knobology. This button changes the orientation of the indicator dot. On the right, you can adjust the depth. Sliding down will increase the depth, so remember, down is deeper. This is how to freeze the image. To the right, Press the button to record video clips of usually 4 to 6 seconds, but you can also press again to stop recording. To the left is the button to save the image on the screen. This is how to adjust the gain. The overall gain is below, the deep field gain is in the middle, and the near gain is on top. Also this is the auto gain button which will reset your gain to the default settings. This is how to change the frequency setting of the probe. Remember to visualize deeper structures, hit the PEN or penetration mode. For more detailed functions, press the more controls button. However, you don't usually need to change these options. To the left are the buttons to change the mode from regular two-dimensional or 2D to motion mode or M mode or color Doppler or pulse wave Doppler. Lastly, when you are finished with the patient encounter, you can end the exam with this button. The export also has one to two minute video educational modules. So let's say you need to brush up on the technique for an exam or just knobology. You can select here or for modules on the different applications you can select acute care, anesthesiology, or procedures. Under each category there is a drop down menu of videos for selected applications. So for example here is a video on IVC sonography. Once you're ready to return to scanning, press the green scan button on the bottom left. To review your saved images and clips, hit the review button and select the patient. Then hit thumbnails and you'll have the images and or clips that were saved on the patient encounter. Clips have a play button that you can press and the video plays on the monitor above. These are important rules to ensure that the machine is ready to go and available for use. First. Always have the probe in your hand or back on the rack. It only takes one drop on the floor to damage your probe, which takes about 10 grand each to replace. If you're planning on scanning on non-intact skin or mucosa, use a cover, glove, or tegaderm to protect the probe. Disinfect the probe every time after scanning. First wipe the gel off the probe with a paper towel, then spray the surface with pie spray. Wipe after 10 seconds with a paper towel or you can use one of these Santa Cloth HB disinfection wipes. 
from the blue top canisters. If there is ever a problem, please email me for the All of You issues and Dan for Reagan issues. Next, to enter an interpretation in ORCID, select Procedure Notes. Then in the drop-down menu, select ED Ultrasound Note. Now you can select the exam that you performed on the left, and with each exam, you can check the boxes that apply. There's also a free text box that you can use. Also check the required disclaimer that this is a limited or focused study and not a comprehensive study. You can also add other providers if you need, but if you perform the study and are logged into ORCID, you can skip this step. To finish your, your interpretation, click the green check mark on the top left. Say you place an interpretation, but then review the images you're attending and you need to update your initial interpretation. Go to the provider notes, find the ED ultrasound note, then double click and you'll be able to modify the interpretation. To finish, click the green check mark on the top left. Thanks again for watching this video. You should have a foundation for the philosophy and practice of clinical ultrasound, as well as how to navigate the logistics of using the machine as well as with documentation. I'd like to leave with this video because it shows how, like with anything in medicine, when you're presented with classic and clear images, ultrasound can be deceivingly simple. However, it is an image acquisition that requires practice and practice and practice before you can obtain consistently good images. And it also takes viewing hundreds to thousands of images in the spectrum of clearly normal to clearly abnormal before you begin to develop expertise in interpretation. At this point, you may be feeling good, saving lives while getting your patients admitted or discharged while avoiding unnecessary testing and imaging and you feel like you may have arrived. But even then, there is always still more to learn. Thank you, and may you continue to develop your skills to become an ultrasound master one day.